Humanist Hour, the official broadcast of the American Humanist Association. I am Kim Ellington, and this is... Todd Stiefel. And we are... The co-hosts. <laughs> we're sitting up here. We're, we're the people you're stuck with today. Actually, thank you for coming. This is really, really cool for us. We don't get to do it, we don't get to do it live very often. Last time... In fact, this is only our second time ever live. Well, we're alive when we do it. We are. Yeah. Okay, so they've got that going for us. Our, our uh, guest today is Dr. Steven Novella, but he's right there, and we're going to be like, give him the cool intro in a second, but just so you know who that guy is sitting next to us. Hi. Hi there. <laughs> Yay! So yeah, thanks for joining us. The Humanist Hour podcast or show, because we're actually, believe it or not, played on a couple of radio markets, is a weekly show that is aired on iTunes, and you can also find it at podcastthehumanist.com, and is the official show of the American Humanist Association. Humanism is essentially the philosophy of being good without a god. That's the simple version. They've got some technical thing, but I'm not going to read that right now. And you can come to my table over like in the same floor and I've got a whole bunch of stuff. So if you're not familiar with it, I can get you more familiar. But pretty much as long as you're a good person, you're a humanist. Indeed. Up with people. How's your Dragon Con going, Todd? Fantastic. This is my first Dragon Con. I'm having a great time. Got to dress up like a disco ball or whatever I was <laughs> yesterday. And Normally, so it's interesting, walking around this part of the world, no, nobody even looks twice at a guy dressed up like a disco ball. Like, it is boring, whatever, like, we're looking for guys with real costumes. But we wandered off for lunch and ended up in the Atlanta underground. And there, I got some attention. <laughs> Random people stopping and posing me for pictures, and people running out of their shops screaming like, hey man, I like your suit, that's awesome. Thanks, <laughs> I got that on the MARTA yesterday. People were like, are you dressed up for something? I was like, no, it's Saturday. This is what I wear on Saturday. I know it's right. Yeah, like, what are you talking about? That was crazy. Did you, did you dress up like a crystal ball? I did not wear a costume this year, no. But you have in the past? No. Oh. <laughs> well, there's always tonight. There's always tonight, that's true. I'm still waiting for the perfect costume. I haven't found one, so I... You know what I mean? It's a uh, paralysis of analysis kind of thing. Uh, There's too many choices out there. That's what I'm like with, the, with tattoos. I've thought about getting a yeah. tattoo, but it's like, it better be darn good it's if it's on my body decision, forever. Yeah. So, yeah, I haven't come up with anything. You know you can take costumes off, right? Uh, uh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Just saying. So I guess we should do the official bio, even though we've kind of already started talking. Uh, we won't do our bios because we're not interesting. Our guest is. <laughs> so Dr. Steve Novellis here, he is an academic neurologist at Yale University School of Medicine. He is the host of a, kind of a lesser known podcast, not quite as famous as the Humanist Hour. Um, yeah, but they're getting up there. They're moving on up. The, uh, it's called The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. He's the president and co-founder of the New England Skeptical Society, the author of Neurologica blog, mm -hmm. as well as a contributor to like 18 other blogs. <laughs> I don't think he does anything other than blogging and writing for magazines like Skeptical Inquirer. And he's also the senior fellow for the James Randi Foundation in charge of their science-based medicine program. So mm -hmm. let's welcome Dr. Steve Novella. Thank you. So I actually came to your podcast last night. Mm -hmm. Very fun. I saw some of you there. I met some of you there, which was really, really fun. Um, that was a good time. Thank you. You yeah. guys have a good time. Yeah, we, we, uh, we love doing the live shows. We've been doing them at you know, two or three conventions a year now since 2006, I think was our first one. Um, so it's a little bit of a different dynamic. We actually get to see each other, you know, because normally we're talking over, like we talk over Skype when we're recording the show, so you can't see the other people, and you lose all the visual cues that you normally have in a conversation, like when someone else is about to speak, you have no idea. <laughs> so we fix it all up in post, though. You know, so we were con somebody asked me once, I think it was Fraser Kane who does a podcast, it's like, how do you guys keep from talking on top of each other all the time? It's like, we don't, we're always talking over each other, and I just separate it all out in post-production, so it's a complete myth. You know, they, they, it's, they, what you're hearing is, is um, fake in terms of how clean it is. But when we're together, it's a, the, the dynamic is very different because you could actually see the other people, you know, when someone's about to, t to say something dumb. And you can read the audience too, like, I'm gonna yeah. know we're starting to suck when my kids start falling asleep or pulling out right. their iPods here in the front row, so yeah, that's, that's probably, yep, they're already giving me the look, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, already there. 
Yeah, I left mine at home for that reason. I didn't kind of look. All right, so on your show yesterday, um, when does that one get broadcast? The show we recorded last night will be broadcast next Saturday. Okay, so I'm not going to ruin it for anybody, but you did go to the paranormal track mm -hmm. and have some fun. Um, <laughs> he did, yeah, yeah, a little stealth investigation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's interesting when you have, at a, at a place like this, where we have folks, the skeptical, and then all the way over to the paranormal. Mm -hmm. So did you feel a change in the force when you walked in that room? Yes, I mean, it was definitely a different crowd. There's no question that when we were over, we were you know, set in on a, a panel on ESP, and the, um, the, the, the one person who was running, running the, that one hour was trying to convince the audience that everyone has psychic power. And they were doing some remote viewing and some telepathy. And it was typical, it wasn't even a cold reading, it was just everyone just guessing as to what the picture was and then way over interpreting whatever they were saying. It was, you know, it was completely lame. We actually ditched after about 20 minutes because we couldn't take any more of it. It was just so bad. Uh, but, you know, it, it, you know so we, we talked about that a little bit more in depth on the show that we recorded last night. But um, that, I always find that fascinating. So we've done inve investigations over the years. I mean, the, the New England Skeptical Society was partly an investigating um, society, and we did, you know, a couple of dozen local investigations across the board, EVP, UFOs, ghosts, et cetera. Um, the Warrens were our big investigation, Ed and Lorraine Warren, because they're right there in Connecticut. I mean, literally like 20 minutes from where we live. Um, but what's a, what always, every single time, what always strikes me, whenever I do a first-hand investigation, is that the subject of our investigation is always at least an order of magnitude more lame than we anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> They're always dumber than we think. We always <laughs> way over prep. Uh, you know, like we think, oh, like they have some kind of sophisticated situation going on there, but it's, I mean, it's incredible. So I guess it's better to over prep than under prep, but really, really, it's just, they got nothing. Mm. I mean, it's just, the, it's the most simplistic, childish thing that you could imagine every single time. From a neurological standpoint, or perhaps just from your other science studies, what is it about our brains that makes some people skeptical and some people more pseudoscientical? So, yeah, I don't, I don't know that we've identified, like, the skeptical module in the brain. That'd be interesting. Um, but there's a number of things. There's a number of different pathways. So I think most people are curious. And, that, you know, some people say that kids are born scientists. I think that's half correct. They, they're born, I think, with the innate curiosity and, and desire to explore. But there's also a, a very analytical process in there that has to be learned and you're definitely not born with that. We are born curious but gullible, is just is the ba our baseline, the default mode of human operation. And there's a host of psychological um, and neurological things that all conspire together to lead us to have beliefs and to maintain whatever beliefs that we have. It's very hard to get people off of cherished beliefs or beliefs that they've held for a long time or ones that they have any kind of emotional investment in. Um, so, I think, th you know, somebody who is a self-identified skeptic, um, who is, you know, I think part of the skeptical community, uh, uh, functioning as a, a scientific skeptic is what I would call it, they have developed to at least a reasonable degree a fairly sophisticated skill set that involves um, understanding of mechanisms of self-deception, certain humility about the way our, our own brains work, a process of systematic doubt and questioning and stepping back from whatever their emotional or gut reaction is. So it's a, it's a collection of intellectual habits that take years to develop, really. Um, now, I think that there is a lot of people who, who call themselves skeptics, but they're really just cynics. And, or they're contrarians, they think that they just take a contrary view to everything else, that that makes them a skeptic, but that's not what I would call a skeptic. Um, or they are, they are, I think, genuinely interested in being, you know, scientific and rational, but they, ha they haven't invested the time in developing the skills yet, so that's kind of where I think our role is, is mainly in teaching people who want to be skeptical how to be better skeptics, you know. So for the people who are going to be listening to this later when we yeah. uh, record it back, many of them don't know much about skepticism. Mm -hmm. And 
a lot of them might get fooled by the people who claim to be yeah. skeptics but aren't using actual skepticism. They're really pseudo skeptics. How for the kind of rookie person out there who's unfamiliar with territory, what are some of the ways to quickly tell the difference between a true skeptic and the people yeah. who claim to be skeptics, like think, I'm a, a vaccine skeptic. I think they should, first of all, be forced to use They the air should quotes. have to use yeah, the air quotes. I'm a skeptic, so, um, so I know yeah. these things. Unfortunately, we don't own the word skeptic. Yeah. You know, there's no TM after it or anything. But so, like, the you know, climate skeptics, vaccine skeptics, they, they've used, they've incorporated the word. You know, like, we're, we're building some, you know, brand cachet behind the word skeptic, and then they go and steal it from us and try to use it to, to bolster their own, their own belief system. But, um, yeah, there's definitely some red flags. You know, so um, scientific skepticism, uh, which is you know, the, in the modern terms has been around for about 60 or so years, although the tradition goes way back to ancient Greece um, in terms of skepticism itself philosophically, and then the scientific part sort of came in later. But um, sort of the modern scientific skepticism movement going back to, uh, you know, Carl Sagan and, and, and those guys, um, that is a process of evaluating all claims. And it, it follows a few basic rules. One is that the more extraordinary the claim, the more extraordinary the evidence has to be in order to justify tentatively accepting you know, that that claim may be true. Um, it is a systematic application of doubt, but the doubt is then is followed up by a scientific, you know, rational process. It's not just doubting. It's not just denying uh, what other people think is true. It's following some kind of, of a rigorous process to determine what's true and what's not true. Skeptics want to believe what is actually true. You know, that's, it's the process that matters, and and trying to get as close as possible to um, reality. And uh, whereas pseudo-skeptics, they sort of pretend to be skeptical, but they're not really following a process. And they're usually, they're, the belief that they're, de that they're either denying or defending is closely tied to their ideology. So that's always a red flag, you know, if a sort of a extreme um, conservative is denying climate change, you know, that, may not be because of their dedication to science, you know, maybe for some other reason why, why they're, they're doing that. Uh, so those are sort of the quickie sort of red flags, but, you know, the, the other bottom line is that to really tell the difference sometimes, you just have to have a good working knowledge of, of the scientific process and critical thinking. I found it interesting. I'm pretty sure I heard air quotes around reality when you said yeah. that there too. Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, reality is a good, sort of a complicated concept, but that's uh, so it's just a matter of wanting to believe what's actually real, mm -hmm. you know. Um, sometimes we, you know, the, our community gets criticized. Like, you guys are so reality based. It's like, yeah, <laughs> that you got a problem with reality, you know. That's that's what, so. Why would you want anything else, you know? But people, that's you know, we take for granted. I mean, so part of our, the philosophical underpinnings of scientific skepticism, it's really only a couple of things. You know, we, one is methodological naturalism, you know, which is the, the philosophical term for you can't make shit up. Right, you, there's, you can't invoke magical explanations for stuff. Um, there is a, for every physical cause, for every physical effect, there is, a, there is a physical cause. And physical meaning just part of the natural world, that there's nothing other than the natural world. Um, there's a, sometimes we argue about whether or not you have to be a philosophical um, naturalist or just a methodological naturalist, meaning Science has to act as if nature is all there is. There's no other choice. Uh, it, science doesn't work if you can at any point say, and then a miracle happens. You can't, the, the process of science is incompatible with that. So that's the methodological naturalism. So you, there's no choice. You have to do that if you're doing science. But that doesn't mean that the natural world is all that there actually is. Um, it just means we can't know about anything scientifically that's outside of the, the realm of naturalism. So that's the philosophical naturalism. We think not only do we have to act as if nature is all there is, but that's really all. I believe that that's all that there is. Whereas science is agnostic towards the philosophical end. It just says, no, but whether or not there is anything supernatural, science has to w operate within the confines of what is natural because that's the only thing that's knowable. But it also means there are some things about which we just say we don't know, or that's outside the realm of science. And that you have to be okay with that. You don't necessarily have to have an answer for everything. I mean, if you're even reasonably creative, you can come up with hypotheses that could never be tested by science. 
And what do you, what do you say about that? Some people like, want you to commit to a belief about it. My position is it's, it's unknowable, so I don't care. You know, if, I don't, I don't, if you could believe in it all you want. Does it, I don't believe or disbelieve in it. It's unknowable, and that's really all you need to say about it. So part of that question comes from a friend of mine who's just like a week ago starting to explore some of the skeptical things. So I referred him to yeah. your, your show and a variety of websites, JREF and uh, Center for Inquiry, things like that. And he's wondering about genetically modified foods and organisms. He's kind of, he's read things on either side of the equation and trying to filter out what's legitimate, what's not, what's true science, what isn't. And so a question he wanted to ask was essentially, are there any legitimate concerns with GMOs right now? Are there any kind of important unanswered questions or plausible concerns that we need to learn more about? Or is the jury kind of, is it decided? Is this safe? Yeah, that's a, it's a bit of a false dichotomy. The, is it safe or is it, should we be concerned? It's always a spectrum. And GMO is also, it's a category. It's a type of technology. So really you want to think about like every specific genetically modified organism is do we have to be concerned about that or not? So like if you want to genetically modify a plant, for example, that will destroy any weeds that it comes in contact with, that, I would be cautious about that one. You know, that could have unintended ecological consequences. But like golden rice, which is simply adding some vitamin A to rice, there's really nothing anyone's come up with that is a legitimate concern about that technology. Nothing at all. So all they could say is, oh, we could spend our money better elsewhere without relying on high technology. That's not even an argument. It's that there's really nothing to say about it. So you have to understand that GMO as a technology is kind of a, like saying, should we be concerned about drugs, about pharmaceuticals? It's like, well, which pharmaceutical for what? You know, you got to drill down to a little bit more detail. Um, but having said that, you know, if you want to just make some broad brushstroke kind of statements about the technology itself, again, you still have to separate out into like transgenic versus cisgenic. In other words, are you taking genes from closely related plants or, or organisms? Or are you going far afield? And does that, is that a concern? Does, do, are, do we introduce more unknowns? So there is a, there is a pretty robust scientific consensus about GM tech as a technology. As a technology, it, it works. It does what it's supposed to do. You're, we're able to take a gene from a bacteria and put it in a plant and have that gene be expressed. Um, the geneticists are, are, have a fairly high degree of confidence that we can do that and test the final product to the point where the chance of any big surprise is pretty low. It's never zero. You know, you, vaccines could cause mutations or whatever. I mean, that's, that's not literally true, but it, you, the thing is, it's never a zero probability. You know, vaccines could have some horrible effect that no one ever thought about, but it's just not, it, the chance is so low, it's not worth worrying about. And then, you know, do we, the other question is, do we have the regulations in place to pick up a problem if it occurred? Um, and the regulations are actually pretty robust with, with genetically modified organisms. And you could also say that, well, let's compare GMO to other types of food. Um, like, should we be more concerned about GMO versus, say, hybridization or um, mutation farming? How many people here are aware of mutation farming, which has been going on for 100 years, where farmers will treat their field with either chemicals or radiation or something to increase the number of mutations so that they have more variety, then they can then select the plants that mutate the traits that they're looking for. This has been going on for 100 years. Nobody cares. Again, nobody was, even was aware of it. And I would be way more concerned about that than, than d deliberately taking one gene and putting it into an organism. So there's this disconnect between level of risks and the level of concern that people have because there's a huge anti-GMO lobby. Um, so there's, there's internal inconsistencies in their position. You know, why should we really, what, hybrids mix hundreds of genes together why would, uh, why would that be, why shouldn't we be testing those? We don't test those, you know, hybrid organisms. Um, so there's a, you can take, look at every argument and try to take it to its final conclusion. And I've done that for GMO. I've I, I, usually for complicated topics like that, I might study them for a year or two before I start to write about them until mm -hmm. I feel like, okay, I've kind of wrapped my head around this enough that I, I'm not going to be blindsided by some major gap in my knowledge. 
Um, and I consult with scientists. You know, I have you know colleagues and friends who are genetic engineers who are some involved directly in genetic modifying organisms. And just to make sure, is my understanding on this correct? You know, am I missing anything here, or is this pretty much what the scientific consensus is? And the bottom line is that there's a robust consensus that genetically modified organisms, as a technology, it's not inherently risky. Um, that it's the, the testing and the regulations are fairly robust, and the probability of anything horrible happening is quite low, and probably back in the background noise of just food technology in general. And so the sort of the um, anti-GMO hysteria really doesn't have a solid scientific or logical basis to it. And if you then look at their arguments, and you drill down as far as you can on each one, they all tend to evaporate when you drill down far enough. Um, or you get down to just a political opinion. I just don't like big companies being in control of our food supply. Okay, that has nothing to do with GMO, but fine, if that's, if that's your, that's your you know, political position. But let's at least separate out the political positions from the scientific questions. But um, people don't like to do that. So people have, are uncomfortable saying, I have this position, but it's complicated. There are some points that in, in its favor, some points against it. People don't like, to, it's hard work to have a nuanced, middle of the road, balanced opinion. People like to say, I'm anti-GMO. And therefore, I'm going to endorse every single anti-GMO point that there is, whether or not it's legitimate. They don't necessarily consciously say that, but that's how they behave. And we all tend to slip into that. We pick a, we pick a pony and we ride it. You know, that's, that's the, we pick a position and we defend it and we like every argument we hear that's in favor of that position and we dismiss every argument that we hear as opposed to saying, okay, well, they have a point there. I disagree with them here. It's a trade-off. You know what I mean? But the, the real life is complicated, but that's a lot of work to try to maintain a complicated, nuanced position about a complicated, you know, uh, idea. So, like, people have, are politically against GMO for some reason. They want to marshal all the scientific arguments against it, even when they're not legitimate, rather than acknowledging the scientific arguments. Or you could take global warming, it's the same thing. If you think, I don't want the government regulating corporations to that much, that's my political ideology. Okay. You don't have to then deny the science of climate change because that's your political opinion. But they do. But most, many people do. They will take scientific opinions that go along with their ideological positions. But you really need to make a conscious effort to disconnect the two. The science is what it is. Sometimes it supports your position. Sometimes it doesn't. You've got to deal with it. I don't know of any studies on this, but kind of in your experience, have you seen any correlation between the type of people who are heavily against GMOs and say, well, we don't know, there's this risk because it's been untested. And the people who are very pro-natural medicine and yeah. on the other side, we're like, well, I'm going to take these pills. I mean, yeah, but so what? It hasn't been tested. It's natural. It's got to be yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah. So there is a huge naturalistic fallacy in anti-GMO ideology and also in natural foods and natural medicines, et cetera. So there's a huge overlap there. The GMO topic is more ideologically complicated than a lot of other ones. Like if you talk about climate change, it's pretty much right wing you know, anti, you know, climate change denial. If you talk about GMO, it, there seems to be a bimodal sort of distribution of people who are anti-GMO. There definitely is the politically left, naturalistic, you know, what I might call granola, you know, type of culture that are against corporations and against, you know, you know technology and our food and all that. But there's also then more of a right-wing sort of anti-government component to it. They're like, well, we don't want the government, we don't trust the government to be regulating the food production, we don't trust them with this. Um, so GMO tends to straddle, anti-GMO you know, tends to straddle right and left because there's this sort of two, we see that with alternative medicine as well, it kind of spans the political spectrum because you have anti-corporate on the left and anti-government on the right and they kind of agree that therefore whatever the mainstream thing is, we're gonna, we're gonna disagree with that. But they have different reasons for doing so. So, so, so it's, the, the, it's interesting in that way. Then there's the conspiracy theorists who, you know, everything is a conspiracy. It doesn't matter what the ideology is. <laughs> they're just, they're a minority, but they're like just a hardcore, whatever conspiracy is out there, they're, they're for it. And then there's other people who, you know, you can get, you can get to the anti-science or the conspiracy position from either political direction. But it's asymmetrical, but I mean, it, it's interesting. Sometimes they're... The landscape's a little bit more complicated. I'd like to see that uh, that bumper sticker, pro-conspiracy, yeah. <laughs> anti-conspiracy. <laughs> I'm going to make those up. That would be awesome. All right, so one of the things that um, I found was very interesting as I was finding out about your very interesting life mm -hmm. 
I love the internet. Um, but one of the things that it's you all do, lies. It's yeah. all lies. <laughs> there were a few of them. So one of the things that you do, you have done, is um, some of the work for the James Randi Educational Foundation yeah. and actually debunking some of the stuff for the $1 million prize. And for yeah. any listeners, I'm sure here we know, but for listeners who don't know, um, James Randi Educational Foundation, which we, you've heard um, us refer to as JREF, they actually have a $1 million, I think the actual name is the $1 million Paranormal Challenge. And it's a prize to anyone who can actually prove paranormal or occult or um, any kind of supernatural. And that's been going on for years. years and so one of the yeah. things that, that you have done is actually work on some of these and try to disprove them. Yes, yeah, so them. there is a like initial screening process um, and we volunteer, this is more like the New England Skeptical Society, because this is going back, you know, even before we had the podcast. Um, essentially we said, hey, we're available to you as a local Connecticut group. If any applicants are from our area, we'd be happy to screen them for you. And so we did. We screened several applicants. Um, again, all far more lame than we ever anticipated going in. So like one that, that was interesting was a husband and wife that claimed that they could op operate a Ouija board. You know, they could actually, you know, you answer questions that were posed. I could totally do that when I was eight. Yeah. I totally oh, yeah. did it. So we said, fine. So we developed, we developed a protocol with them. So we're going to do it blindfolded. You know, so if, you, if you're, right, that's the, that's, the, that's the way to see if it's real or not. If, if it's at least one way to test the hypothesis. If they're controlling the Ouija board, then they shouldn't be able to do it when they're blinded, when they're blindfolded. And if the, sp if the spirits are controlling the, the Ouija board, then they should be able to do it when they're blindfolded. So, right, and they agreed, and we, and we set up a protocol, and we filmed everything. And so it was a husband and wife. So going in, we're like, okay, so what's going on here? It's, it's either one of them is in on it, or they're both in on it, right? Um, but at least one of them is in on are, are moving the, the planchette around, and the other one may be the dupe. So, so let's see how long it takes us to figure out who it is. It took us two seconds. <laughs> so the wife comes in, and she had injured her finger and had a splint on her finger. So she came in with the, with the ex automatic excuse, like, I don't know if it's going to work tonight. I mean, my finger's injured. Like, okay, well, you still you want to you, you give it a try? You still want to go forward? So they, they went ahead and they went forward. So we blindfolded them, and they couldn't even get the planchette to land on a letter, let alone spell anything out. I mean, they, because, you know, you, you, you might imagine, if you're, if you're doing it blindfolded, you, you don't even know where the letters are. I mean, so they were stopping, like, we couldn't even decide what letter it was. And sometimes it would go off the board entirely. I mean, it was, they, they needless to say, they utterly failed. But it was obvious from watching the interaction between the two that the wife was scamming the husband. <laughs> That was our conclusion. I wonder at what point she wet her pants when we yeah. were like blindfolds and she was like, oh, no. Well, they really did it. Because we made, we made sure they could not see through the blindfolds. We made absolutely sure. And we actually made up our own board so that they couldn't have memorized the board. But we didn't have to do that. That's, we always go farther than we had to do. We didn't even have to go that far. No. I'm going to ask a specific question. You may yeah. know nothing about this. And if so, okay. feel free to punt on the question. Like, th this is not sure. my area. But I wanted to mix in some easy questions and some harder ones. So. I, Did we get into hard ones yet? No. You feeling <laughs> about to, maybe. So I, I've heard a hypothesis, and there's been some papers about this, that there may be a link between ALS, which mm -hmm. this is, I was reminded of this because of the ice, ALS ice bucket challenge. It's gone totally viral. Uh, that there may be a link between that and cyanobacteria, mm -hmm. and that they've seen some, they <laughs> have seen some clustering, they've done studies where they've mapped it out, and there tends to be a population density of cases around bodies of water. Of course, mm -hmm. there tends to be population density around <laughs> yeah. bodies of water. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and some of this went back to Guam, where apparently there was really high levels of it, yeah. and it turned out they were eating a bat that ate a plant in the cyanobacteria. Yeah. So, A, are you aware of this hypothesis, and what are your thoughts on this? Is this pseudoscience? Is it potential? No, so, um, first of all, um, there, there, are, there are clusters of uh, ALS and that defy um, statistics. So they have, there has to be an environmental trigger. Like Guam is the one, Guam was the big one, right? The big, why is there this cluster in, in Guam that goes beyond anything else? And it wasn't just ALS. It was like ALS plus Parkinson's and mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. Like people were getting all three neurodegenerative disorders all at the same time. 
Um, and that was a mystery for decades, and they did eventually figure it out, that it was, it wasn't, the, so the, the natives were, were chewing the nuts that had the neurotoxin in them, but they were not getting enough of the, of the toxin for that to be the cause. But then they realized that the bats were eating the nuts and concentrating the toxin, and the people were eating the bats, and they were getting a high enough dose then, and that explained it, so that's a done deal. So we know that that's, that's the cause of the Guam uh, concentration, the Guam cluster. Um, otherwise, ALS is fairly sporadic, meaning it just it, it's sort of occurs at random, um, at least most of it. Then there are this familial ALS, that's a genetic disorder, so that's separate. So you have to separate out familial ALS where we know it's genetic. Then there's sporadic ALS, and then you have to pull out the clusters, which, you may, which probably have an environmental factor. Um, for sporadic ALS, we, don't, we have, just have no idea. And the researchers are constantly searching for risk factors that might predict who has a higher risk of getting ALS. One that, that has cropped up was um, prior electrocution. So like if you were had ever been shocked and survived, then 20 years later you have a higher chance of getting ALS. Okay, that, that, that really, it, these are like epidemiological sort of uh, things that are still in the hypothesis stage. They've never really been proven. So it's perfectly, a plausible that a toxin from cyanobacteria or you know and, or many other sources may in fact increase your risk of getting ALS. It's just really hard to, to nail those kinds of things down. So that one is still in the hypothesis stage. So I would say plausible but currently unknown. I, I just I guess it's being a dragon con, but I just had this like image in my mind of like the downfall of electric-based supervillains, like Electro. Yeah. <laughs> like Spider-Man couldn't get me, but now I have ALS. <laughs> right. And everybody wearing those little little things. That yeah, the, the arc generators or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they yeah. give you ALS. Yeah, that's right yeah. here. That's what I heard. Yeah. I heard that. Yeah. I took mine off after that. Right. Yeah. That and autism. They give you autism too. <laughs> <laughs> but that goes to everything gives you autism. So. So why not? So I want to talk vaccines a minute. So sure. I, I have, speaking of autism, right on cue. Thank you. For, <laughs> thank you for that segue. You so, see how good we are? I, I, I want to talk about a side of it that, that I don't hear as much, although I'm not in this skeptical yeah. community nearly as much as you are, and maybe not the rest of you, although I follow it on the periphery for sure. So vaccines in herd immunity. This is something that's really important to me. I actually have an immunity deficiency, common mm -hmm. variable. It's, it's not contagious, but I don't, my, I don't have immune memory. Right. So I get a vaccine, I won't necessarily, my body won't necessarily remember I got it. So for me, I depend mm -hmm. on everyone else getting the vaccine to keep me safe. So what are your thoughts on the concepts of, of kind of the anti-vax movement and the ethical issues surrounding, surrounding that, including herd immunity? Yeah, so the herd immunity is, the, the notion there is that when enough people are immune to an infectious organism, the organism can't spread. You know, there's, there's likely to be too many there's too much distance between one susceptible person and another susceptible person. So you don't get outbreaks. You just have individual cases. So herd immunity prevents outbreaks. That, and and there's no, that's uncontroversial. There's no question about that. It's been you know, demonstrated over and over again. Um, in order to have herd immunity, you need about 90, 95% of people. So like the right around there is when it really kicks in. When you start to drop below 90%, herd immunity starts to go away. Um, you know, definitely below 80%, you know, there's no herd immunity. Then there's enough susceptible individuals where outbreaks can happen. And, and we unfortunately have lots of data on this now because there are, <laughs> there are communities that have fallen below herd immunity levels in certain vaccinations or all vaccinations. And in those pockets, it, our numbers are still 95% for the country, for, for the UA, USA, but there are pockets of very low immunization rates and that's where the outbreaks are happening. So they're happening in communities that have lost herd immunity because of low vaccination rates. There's no question about that either. I mean, the epidemiology, this is just numbers. This is just math now. And the numbers are telling a very consistent story. Um, and again, getting back to the notion of, like when you look at the arguments of one ideological group and you take each argument and drill down to the end, what do you ultimately find out? Was it a legitimate point or not a legitimate point? And the anti-vaccinationists always raise the same points that have been demolished multiple times before. One 
One is saying, well, if you're vaccinated, why do you care about herd immunity? Well, because of you, right? Because of people like you who can't get vaccinated or who are ill or who just do not respond to the vaccines. So we need to protect people who can't protect themselves with their own immunity. Um, and because no, and the vaccines are not 100%. You know, they're even the best vaccine, maybe 98% or so effective. That's still a lot of people out there who aren't going to mount a sufficient antibody response to the vaccine. So they need to be protected as well. Um, they also might say things like, well, if you look at an outbreak, more people who were vaccinated were affected than people who were unvaccinated. It's like, yeah, but that's, that's a, they're playing with math. If you have you know, 100 people who are vaccinated to everybody who isn't vaccinated, there's going to be more non-responders in the vaccinated group than there are people in the unvaccinated group. So that just because of the population is so much greater, it's always going to be more people who are vaccinated tend to get infected than unvaccinated. But if you look at the risk of getting infected, it's like 10 times the risk in the unvaccinated population as the vaccinated population. That's the real statistics statistic you want to look at. So all of their arguments just don't hold water. They all break down when you investigate them and see if they make sense and what, if they, are they supported by evidence. Um, so the, the, the tricky then bit is the ethical question. Is like, what's our ethical responsibility there for? And there's, science doesn't have an answer to that. Science can give us the numbers, right? You could tell us what herd immunity is, why it works, how successful vaccines are, what the risks versus benefits are. And then we have to decide as a society what you know, how far we're going to go in mandating it. You know, so right now in the U.S., you have to get vaccinated in order to get into public school, uh, but that's it. If you don't go to public school, then you don't have to get vaccinated. Um, in the U.K., it's, uh, it's entirely voluntary. Um, so, and then the, the, the question is, uh, what about exemptions? So is right now every state allows for medical exemptions. That's a no-brainer. You know, if you're medically not able to get a vaccine, of course we can't force you to get it. Um, a lot of states allow for religious exemptions. Uh, that, that had, that's a largely due to the Christian scientists because they um, were very instrumental in pushing for laws in states that allowed for parents to be exempt from any mandated medical care and then vaccines sort of came along for the ride. So there the sort of the anti-vaccine community and the Christian science community were together on the, the religious exemptions for vaccines. But now you have the people who are anti-vaccine, but not for religious reasons, and they're pushing for a philosophical exemption, saying, basically, I don't want my kids to get vaccinated just because I don't, I don't believe the science, you know, whatever, just because I don't believe in the vaccines. Um, and that's really controversial. Um, religious exemptions are controversial too, but the, the philosophical, I mean, I think the scientific community is like, that's where they would draw the lines. Like, no, philosophical exemptions are, are absurd. Religious exemptions, you know, that's a hard one. You know, um, a lot of people think that they shouldn't be allowed. Um, other people think that, you know, you have to respect people's religious beliefs and um, you know, that, so they would draw the line in a different place. Um, but then there's, all, there's lots of sub-questions like, even if you allow non-medical exemptions, you could make it easy or hard for people to get them. So. Uh, and this is interesting because like, we had this debate amongst ourselves in the science-based medicine community because we you know, had to have a position. Like, what's our position on religious exemptions for vaccines? And we disagreed with each other about it because it's, it's a tough one. Uh, but where we agreed upon was um, if you do allow for any non-medical exemptions, you should make it as hard as possible. Uh, and the states that make it difficult, meaning that you, you can't just, you know, request it. You have to show that this is um, part of a long-standing tradition, you know, in your, in your culture, your religion, etc., whatever. You have to make them jump through some hoops at least to get the exemption. The exemption rates go down. So you're still allowing them for it, you're just making it challenging to get it, and then the exemption rates go down. That's the ultimate goal, is to limit the number of exemptions. Uh, because the more people that get, you know, immunized, the more likely we are to have herd immunity, which again is the ultimate goal, is to get to herd immunity. So that's kind of a, probably a longer answer than you wanted, but that's, it's no, complicated. It's, it's a little complicated, but yeah. are really easy if you have long answers, so <laughs> yeah, feel <okay>. free. <laughs> In North Carolina, you can actually just write, I have a philosophical, mm -hmm problem with it and you just hand them a piece of paper and they put it in the file. Yeah, so that's the worst case scenario. Yeah. Philosophical <laughs> exemptions with a really low bar. Yeah, so that's, yeah. we don't like that. That's yeah. North Carolina in a lot of ways. It's yeah. a real low bar for a lot of things. Yeah. All right, so on a little bit of a, on this, do you want to go heavy again? 
Okay, we're going to go. I want to know what your favorite part of Dragon Con has been. This is my first year. For listeners, if you haven't been to Dragon Con, you have, you've got to come. It's absolutely amazing. Am I right? Am I right? Seriously. <laughs> Listen to the people. It is so much fun. I walked in the door, and yes, there are the paranormal folks and everything else, but this is my people. Like, I was like, how have I not been here before? So, I know you've been here before. Yeah, we've been so here what's a few your, times. Okay, can you, you don't even have to give me this times, but what, all, all over, Dragon Con favorite. It's my, my favorite part is always just walking around and looking at costumes, which I'm sure is the answer a lot of people give. I mean, I like, the, you know, sometimes we, there are people in the walk of fame that I'm really interested in talking to, so that's good as well. But every year, you know, the, the, there are individuals who craft costumes that are just off the hook, movie quality, unbelievable, you know, costumes. I just, I just, so I like, and also it's a challenge to sort of recognize where they're from. I'm up to maybe about 35% or so, <laughs> recognizing there's, there's still a lot of costumes. Like, what the, where the hell is that from? But now I say I'm here with my 15-year-old daughter, she, and she, she'll tell me any ones that I don't know. That's nice. So yeah, it's I have fun. a friend yeah. here named Greg and Valerie, and they're helping me understand yeah. a lot of these, too. And they're very cool. I'm like, oh, I need you. I need you. So who do you want to see on the Walk of Fame to this year? This year, there was nobody there that like, I was dying to see. A couple Not even of Patrick Stewart? Patrick Stewart, yeah, but okay. you're never going to get to Patrick Stewart. <laughs> I mean, not even you. No, oh. I don't have any juice I was here. Hoping, no. I was like, so no. <laughs> no, Patrick Stewart would be fun. But you know, so all right, so there, the the people that I'm interested in talking to, I want are people that I would have like there would be a question I want to ask them. So like. Um, Malcolm McDowell was here in a previous year. I wanted to ask him about his experience with Stanley Kubrick. I had a very specific question I wanted to ask him. Whereas other people, like, are, it's fun to see them, and I love their character on a show, or, but what am I going to ask them? It's like, I liked your character on the show, but they didn't write it. You know, they're just the actor. All I could really talk about is your, their performance, you know, but I don't often care to talk to them about that. So it's usually people who have something in their private life that I'm interested in talking about. Cause like, and usually because they have some kind of scientific or skeptical sort of background that I'm interested in exploring with them. Yeah. I've been joking that song that was played first about make sure your question's a question, that if I had gotten in to see Patrick Stewart, I would have been like, I have a question. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I could have handled that. <laughs> I, I really don't. I'm a little bit that. Yeah, there's a couple people, but Patrick Stewart. Would you like to? Would you like to go to dinner, sir? <laughs> yeah, there's. I actually asked him to dinner. <laughs> anyway, I, I want to ask a really unscientific question. Sure. So. Because mine was so scientific. Yes. Yeah. We've got to have balance. You inspired me, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> and then actually, we're going to open it up pretty soon to Q&A for anybody in the crowd interested. Because, hey, why not? We, we, can record, we, we can record your questions and put them onto a podcast just for fun. So let's say, let, let's get past, forget to ignore the ethical aspects of all this. Let's pretend you have the technology from the Matrix and you can just upload certain skill sets like kung fu mm -hmm. or knowledge bases like speaking Spanish, and you have access to upload one thing to all of the members of the U.S. Congress. Oh, what, boy. What, <laughs> what, what, what skill or knowledge base do you upload to all of I their mean, is, brains? Is critical thinking a knowledge base? <laughs> I, think that, it, I think it is. If you could define that, if I get all that in one chunk, that, there's no question that would be it. I mean, I often I think that, God, if I could just get the world to understand like, this aspect of critical thinking, how much better would it be? I mean, think about how much we waste, how much waste there is in every kind of resource that you could imagine, how much human suffering is caused just because people don't understand some basic concepts of critical thinking. It's, it's scary sometimes when you think about it. It's been interesting to me listening to you talk in your podcast and some other places, and I think it was one, on one of your blogs, you actually you said something about um, how we actually have kind of a humility about our, in fact you said it today, I think a yeah. humility about our brains and some people don't have that. And it's been interesting to me to see the arrogance where some people, well it's, it's, not, it's not, to them it's not arrogance, so I, yeah. I absolutely see that it isn't, but I've been, people have been coming to the American Humanist Association booth and they've been saying that they don't think that there is a morality without an absolute. And they're mm -hmm. completely unaware that the morality that they're even pulling from their absolute, their book, has changed with society. Right. Somebody actually tried to argue with me that society hasn't evolved. And I was like, but I'm not, 
trying to protect myself from you with a spear and a sword right now. So, you know, it's just, it's a completely that's, different yeah, That's mindset. demonstrably false. I mean, that's, that's even just, not even opinion, that's false. But yeah, I agree. I mean, I've had I've gotten into long discussions on on uh, on blogs and and other other places about the whole morality without absolute some absolute source of morality. And I usually start off by saying, well, first of all, first of all, you don't have access to absolute morality. You don't. You have a human being's interpretation of a belief that maybe there is such a thing, but nobody has the direct line to God. So you're really your <laughs> no, people claim that they do, but they but there's no way that they could they could demonstrate that they do, and of course they are mutually exclusive to other people who claim that they do. So then how do we decide whose morality is correct without me having faith in your religion? And there's no answer to that. Then they, they usually then resort to, well, you just, but there has to be, because without it, we have no morality. It's like, well, that's also demonstrably not true. Um, it's also what, what I, I'm, I guess I'm not amazed, but again, it's frustrating when you, when you talk to people about, on this topic like this, and they're just completely unaware of the historical reality that's there, you know, for, in, for the reading. Like, you know, Christian morality demonstrably is based on Greek philosophy. I mean, it's not like it came out of nowhere, or like literally like a bolt out of heaven. There's a, there's a documented historical progression of morality and thought and philosophy, and Christianity emerged out of that tradition you know, completely. It's not even like it really added anything new. It really just was completely out of that philosophical, moral, moral tradition. It's all there. So they're actually saying that, well, you couldn't have, you know, Christian morality without a belief in my religion. Well, it actually predates your religion. <laughs> so you, you, your argument falls down just on factual grounds alone. You know, plus there's also the fact that, you know, atheists aren't running around murdering and raping people. You know, it's, we, we are, if, if you, run those statistics, atheists actually tend to be a little bit more moral than, non, than believers, depending on exactly how you, you know, look at the data. But, it, you know, it's at least not dramatically different. So you mentioned earlier that when there's a, a complicated subject that mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't know very well yet, like GMOs, you research it for a good year before yeah. you start blogging about it. I'm curious if there's anything you haven't started blogging about yet, but you have started researching. Um, yeah, there are some topics, like I haven't, like a lot of people ask me about medical marijuana, and it's like, yeah, I'm still looking at that, you know. I'm, I'm still thinking about still that still thinking one. about it, yeah, dude. I'll get back to you, man. I, I've, I've read a lot about it, but I haven't gotten to the point where I feel comfortable publicly saying, this is my position about it. Um, I, I usually, when I get asked, I say, yeah, it's complicated, and here are the issues, but I don't sort of take a hard stand one way or the other, because... I mean, definitely there are some claims about it that are pseudoscientific, you know, the, and actually David Gorsky on science-based medicine wrote a series of articles about the herbalism around, of, of medical marijuana. But there's some, you know, this, it's a drug like anything else, and there's some legitimacy there, but um, I have to wrap my head around the science a little bit more before I would write about it myself. Mm -hmm. What's the next hot area of skepticism that maybe is just kind of, not many people in this room might even be aware is an issue, but might be a really big issue a year from now. Oh, that's a good question. You know, historically, like, you know, climate change obviously was huge in the last few years, and now for me, GMO is sort of the one thing that I think has, is coming to the fore. Um, I, for me, the, a hot topic is an area where I think there's a pretty clear scientific consensus, but there, that is a huge disconnect from the public opinion. And especially if I feel there's a huge disconnect even from the community of self-identified skeptics. So several years ago, there were a lot of you know, politically conservative skeptics who were anti-global you know, warming deniers. And so that was, a, you know, that was an indicator for me that this is an area that we really have got to start educating people about. And you know, right now, I think I'm sort of in the heyday of the same thing, but with GMO. I think even among my skeptical colleagues, there's, a, there's so much misinformation out there that whenever I get into a conversation with somebody about it, they're usually rattling off one piece of propaganda after another that's demonstrably incorrect. So clearly we have a lot of work to do there. So the next one, I don't know. I don't know, I'm trying to think. I've been thinking while I've been rambling on about what the next one would be. Um, I guess I'm always waiting just to, you know, I'll jump on it when I see it, but there's nothing that I, I'm seeing coming. You know, we'll, we'll have to wait. 
It is interesting. I find it's, um, our daughter is 10, and she's starting to, with supervision, use the internet for research. And you have to be really, really careful. Mm -hmm. Like, you can even still, right to this day, like, if you pop on and look up vaccines right now, you're going to find an article on mercury and thimerosal. Yeah, and how it's and it will seem current if you're not looking at dates, if you're not looking at what you know the, your sources and stuff. So this has got to, this is a huge problem for what you're trying to do. Yeah, it's it's a lot worse than that even. I mean, so it's really hard. It's really challenging. So I mean, I love the internet. It's a double-edged sword, though. The internet is. I mean, I just would never want to go back to the time when I couldn't instantly go online and have access to the world's knowledge and f answer whatever question I had. It's just amazing, but. It's not just that there's misinformation out there. There's ideological groups out there who are well-funded, who are deliberately crafting misinformation, and they're doing it in such a way to make it look as if it has legitimacy. So they're, they're creating fake, legitimate-looking you know, you know, organizations, institutions, publications, and crafting information that is ideologically motivated but is pretending to be objective and scientific. How does the average person distinguish that from a genuine you know, a legitimate source. It's tricky. There's no, no easy way to do it. There's some red flags, but it's really no, like, one litmus test that you can give it. Further, um, the, in, the Internet is a confirmation bias machine, you know, and it's very easy to look for the information that will support your position. And then when you've found that information, you can then stop because you found the, you've done your research, and the research has now validated whatever it is you sought to, to validate in the first place. So you have to train people to actually, when you, when the first thing you do when you start to research a topic is to try to disprove whatever your current position is. Try to disprove yourself as much as you can. And if you're not doing that, if you're looking for information to support your beliefs, you will find it. And the fact that you find it doesn't mean you're right. It just means that you're a person and the internet exists. <laughs> um, and then the third sort of problem is that there are sort of echo chambers in the, on the internet. And so um, once you go beyond sort of just you're doing Google search and, confer and confirmation bias, you could easily get sucked into an echo chamber that will reinforce and magnify your beliefs and insulate your beliefs and and then you think that you know everything because you're getting your information systematically from one point of view and you've, they've crowdsourced it. So there have been you know, thousands, maybe millions of people who have marshaled every argument necessary to insulate the belief. If you go to a vaccine, you know, anti-vaccine website or you go to, like I was, I was found myself on a global warming denial site um, recently, and I read through the comments. I'm like, there you go. I mean, they are all utterly convinced of their position, and they're ridiculing the other side, and they have all these facts to marshal to defend every single point. They're wrong. But, and if you, and, and I'm the troll, right? So if I then say, wait, you know, hey, you know, what about this? You know, then to, to them, I'm the troll all of a sudden. So it's just a, they're in a bizarro world, uh, echo chamber of global warming denial um, that they're trapped in, you know? So it's, almost, it's literally like an intellectual trap there on the internet waiting to ensnare people. Uh, and so, you, yeah, you, I think one of the, and I think this is something that, you know, it needs to be, you know, schools are way behind the times on this. We have to teach kids how to access the internet, how to access information, how to do searches. I know, like, I have two daughters going through this, the public school system, so I have, I'm, I have a pretty good idea what they're getting taught, um, and that's, they're not getting taught that. I mean, they're, they're a little bit, you know, they're, they, they're, they discuss it, but they're not really get, being given hardcore skills that they need. They're, what they're doing, in my opinion, is all a little superficial and isn't real. I, I guess because they don't want to give them the stuff that's too controversial, but that's the stuff you need the skills for you know, is the really controversial stuff. So it's a little bit cleansed, and I think that takes a lot of the real lessons out of it. So I'm filling the gaps, you know, wherever I think they are, you know, in my kids' education. But yeah, they need to be able to go online and not just, like, yeah, don't rely on Wikipedia, go to an official site, sure, that's good. But how do you, like, really tell how authoritative a website is, for example? Or, like, how do you avoid the trap of just confirming your bias? That's the stuff, the real critical thinking stuff that I think they need to be taught way more.
than they are. Don't just rely on documentaries on the Discovery Channel because they may have made up the scientist who's yeah. talking about Megalodon and built an entire website to support his fictional Think about existence. that. I mean, yeah. this is really happening. It's madness. Yeah. So, so we have a couple minutes left. I think we have time for a couple of audience questions if folks would like to line up. Probably just two or three. There's a microphone right there in the middle. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question of Dr. Troll Novella here. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, please make your question in the form of a question. Yes. <laughs> I love um, you. Or we'll throw things. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit about what happens um, to someone's brain when they are in the throes of some kind of religious frenzy, like possessed by a demon or a spirit, things of that nature, and they, they see these visions? Can you kind of walk us through what happens in somebody's brain and body? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of different things, components to that. Um, we do know there's been some very interesting research looking at what happens to people when they're listening to a charismatic speaker who is of their same faith. And what happens is the reality testing critical thinking module in your frontal lobes starts to, to decrease its activity. You actually stop testing what you're being told and you sort of surrender your will to the charismatic person. In fact, it is the same thing that happens when people are hypnotized. So when someone says that they hypnotize the crowd, it's actually literally true. It's actually the same thing going on in the brain. When a charismatic speaker could literally hypnotize a crowd, meaning that they will surrender their reality testing and just accept whatever they're being told. Um, there's also a different part of, there's a different part of the brain that, and this is the usual, for most people this is the right uh, temporal lobe, it's the non-dominant temporal lobe and, uh, and parietal lobe. Uh, as well, there's you know, circuitry in there that makes us feel as if we have a profound connection to the universe and or a higher power. And usually people will interpret that experience in line with their pre-existing religious or cultural beliefs. Um, we know this is true because if you have a seizure in, part, in that part of your brain, you will have a profound religious experience. And it, again, you will probably be in line with your pre-existing religious beliefs, and if you don't have any, you may just say, I just felt one with the universe. That's what people will say if they, that part of the brain gets activated. And people who have, say, epilepsy in that part of the brain tend to be hyper-religious. That's actually a neurological diagnosis, hyper-religiosity. It's a feature of that type of epilepsy, non-dominant temporal of epilepsy. There's a, there's a lot of historical speculation that Joan of Arc may have had that kind of epilepsy when she was having her religious <laughs> you know, visions, they were seizures. Why we have that module is an interesting question. You know, the, the, it's, that's a sort of an adaptational question. One speculation is that as a sort of tribal hierarchical, you know, culture, we, members need to be able to surrender their will to the greater good of the, of the collective, of the, of the society. And therefore, we need to have circuitry in there that goes, yes, I'm going to sacrifice myself for something bigger than myself, my community. Resistance is futile. Yeah. So those, certainly th those tribes who had that module destroyed the ones who didn't, you know. I didn't hear the... Uh, he said the Marine Corps does the that. The Marine Corps, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean this, is a, this, is a, I, this is a cinematic tradition that I love. And this is what Kubrick, actually, one of the, reasons, the things I like about him is he used the military as a representation of civilization, which it, part of which is the sacrifice of the individual for the whole. That's why if you watch Full Metal Jacket, you know, Marines die, but the Corps lives on, right? That's, that's the idea. That's your non-dominant parietal lobe, temporal lobe allowing you to sacrifice yourself and surrender to something bigger than yourself. And it's, you know, that, um, and it's, just, it's obedience and it's, you know, could think about it, what would it take to get somebody to go into a combat where they're likely to get killed? You know, you have to really surrender a lot of your otherwise your self-preservation you know, uh, motivations. So anyway, a lot of that is sort of evolutionary psychology speculation, but th the fact that that wiring is there is unequivocal. We've known about that for a very long time, and it's interesting. Of course, religious people say, well, God put the hard wiring there so that we would believe in him, but there are, there are probably other reasons why it's there. Thank you. Sure. I think we have time for one more question. We're almost out of time. Sorry. Um, what's your opinion on the... Uh, concept of uh, the technological singularity. It seemed like some people were saying, like, yeah, that's 
totally happening like 2040 and there's like you know that's like rapture of the nerves and totally not happening yeah so the, the singularity is the idea that we're going to pass through a techno a point of technological development where we can't predict what's going to be on the other side because essentially we're going to be turning over uh, technological progress to thinking machines that are smarter than we are and once that happens um that you know the, the, then the, the technological progress will be happening at a pace that is greater than humanity can even imagine. Um, there's a, the, the, I don't think there's any question that that's going that something like that is going to happen. Uh, that you know we, we're developing AI. There's no you know reason in the laws of physics why we won't be able to develop computers that are powerful enough and that have the the wiring and the programming to function with aspects of artificial intelligence. Um, and whenever we get to the point where we have a computer that is essentially as smart as a human, there's no reason why in 10 years it's not going to be, you know, five times as smart, and in 100 years it's going to be a million times as smart. That's just, that is a fairly straightforward extrapolation of, of computer technology. Um, what the debates are about are when, when are we going to sort of reach that tipping point, not really if there's going to be a tipping point, but when are we going to get there? and what the full implications are going to be. So, so some people like Kurzweil, you know, they, 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 who wrote The Singularity, um, some people think that they go too far, that it's almost become a religious belief and like this magical thing that's going to happen. But if you strip it down and you just talk about just the, um, the technological aspects of it, the, the real core that you know, we're going to have, at some point there are going to be thinking machines that are a million times smarter than people. I don't see why we're, that's not inevitable. I think that is inevitable that we're going to get there. And there's no question it's going to have a profound effect on our civilization. And I, the, the one thing I absolutely agree with is we can't predict what that's going to be. Um, the, I also don't think we can predict exactly when that's going to happen because there's, there's, we're very bad about projecting, predicting technology more than five years out. Um, unless it's in the pipeline right now, it's, there's too many variables in terms of how it's going to be used and what the hurdles are going to be. and you know, um, if you think about visions of the future from 50 years ago compared to today, they were all off, pretty much in every aspect. Um, so I think we have to be hum humble as well. More, you know, we need humility in the face of predicting where we're going to be in 50 or 100 years. But I think it's, a, you know, the broad brushstroke of that it's going to be amazing is a, probably a pretty safe bet. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, everybody. There's so much good stuff at Dragon Con that you could have been doing other than this as well. The fact that you chose to come here is really, really cool to me. So I appreciate it. No time to end.